oxidations of alcohols convert alcohols into carbonyl compounds. Ketones are aldehydes or carboxylic acids, depending on the strength of the oxidizing agent. And we've seen that oxidation reactions, roughly speaking, can be thought of as the elimination of the elements of dihydrogen from the substrate. When we eliminate H2 from an alcohol, we end up with a CO double bond and a carbonyl compound. These reactions tend to be mechanistically more complex than reduction reactions because we can't just eliminate H- from an alcohol. It, it doesn't really work that way. So we have to transform the alcohol strategically and specifically install a leaving group strategically in order to get this process to go mechanistically. And we'll see what that looks like in this video and dig into chromic acid oxidations, which are the strongest oxidation conditions we'll look at and take primary alcohols all the way up to carboxylic acids. But let's start with oxidation in general. In general, secondary alcohols can be oxidized up to ketones and net what occurs here is the loss of H2 from the substrate to form a ketone as we see on the right here. Now if we start with a primary alcohol, loss of a single equivalent of H2 leads to an aldehyde from a primary alcohol, but further oxidation can replace that aldehyde hydrogen with an OH group going all the way to a carboxylic acid. And so you can see that this is sort of two steps up the oxidation ladder here to go all the way from a primary alcohol up to a carboxylic acid, whereas secondary alcohols don't have that option and of course have to stop at the ketone. Now tertiary alcohols in which there are three R groups linked to the carbon bearing the hydroxyl group, so imagine if this H were an R group that would be a tertiary alcohol, are unreactive under oxidative conditions. Why is this? Well let's draw out a reaction scheme and see why this is. And actually pausing the video now is a good idea. Pause the video and see if you can figure out why tertiary alcohols are unreactive under oxidative conditions like this before we move ahead. All right. What's going on here? Well, a tertiary alcohol is something like terbutanol you see right here. And treatment with an oxidizing agent would hypothetically install a CO double bond with the elimination of hydrogen. But there's a problem here. This carbon, highlighted in red, has five bonds. Never, not even once, should you draw this in your organic chemistry course. So this won't happen. We need hydrogen atoms at both the hydroxyl oxygen, which naturally there will be one there, and the carbon linked to the hydroxyl group. Because there is no hydrogen linked to this carbon, tertiary alcohols are unreactive under oxidative conditions. They'll just sit there. And in fact, the hydroxyl group may do some undesirable things. Pick up a proton and depart, forming a carbocation, and then you can get, for example, um, isomerization at that stereocenter. Just a mess. Just a mess with tertiary alcohols. So we want to avoid Ox, trying to oxidize tertiary alcohols in general. All right, the general mechanistic concept behind oxidation is installing a good leaving group at oxygen, such that an elimination across the carbon and oxygen in the alcohol establishes a CO double bond. So let me show you what I mean by this. Imagine we started with an alcohol, and through some series of elementary steps, we installed a good leaving group, a good nucleophage, linked to the alcohol oxygen. This LG group wants to take this pair of electrons with it and get out of town. And that's akin to an oxidation in and of itself, if you kind of think about it, taking electrons away from this molecule. At the same time, if we could get this, for example, proton to be eliminated and that leaving group to depart, well then we've established a carbon-carbon double bond and we've accomplished the desired oxidation. Now from the aldehyde, further oxidation can occur. So imagine now we, for example, coordinated some good leaving group to the carbonyl oxygen, like we see right here. Addition of water to this intermediate and loss of a proton would lead to something like this. And now we've set up a situation again where we have a saturated oxygen, only single bonds, linked to a leaving group and a potentially acidic hydrogen right here. And so electron flow like this would establish yet another CO double bond leading to a carboxylic acid. This is the basic principle be behind all alcohol oxidation reactions, going all the way from a primary alcohol with two hydrogens here to a carboxylic acid. And there are certain reagents that can't accomplish this and stop at the aldehyde stage. We'll call those 
weak oxidizing conditions, weakly oxidizing or weak oxidizing agents. And there are some conditions that go all the way from the primary alcohol to the carboxylic acid without the ability to stop the aldehyde. And these are strongly oxidizing conditions or strong oxidizers. In particular, keep in mind these elimination steps. These are the steps that really establish those new CO bonds and break the CH bond. This is the essence of oxidation right here of alcohols. Some of the oldest and nastiest conditions for the oxidations of alcohols involve the generation of chromic acid, so-called Jones conditions. And there are variations on the theme of the Jones oxidation, but they all basically involve the generation of chromic acid. And chromic acid is a strong oxidizing agent that will take primary alcohols all the way up to the carboxylic acid. And we're seeing that here where formally we would assign a negative one oxidation number in the primary alcohol all the way up to a plus three oxidation number for the carbonyl carbon in the carboxylic acid product. So four steps up in oxidation level is one way you can think about this. Jones conditions will also oxidize a secondary alcohol up to a ketone, and here it's a more mild change in oxidation number, but only because once we get to the ketone, we're stuck there, right? No way to add more bonds to oxygen to the ketone. You're seeing over the reagent arrow here two different ways to generate chromic acid. The first uses chromium-6 oxide or chromium trioxide, CrO3, and a strong acid like H2SO4. We can also use sodium dichromate along with sulfuric acid. Either of these conditions will work just fine. I tend to use the first just because it's easier to remember. Chromic acid plus sulfuric acid, uh, chrom chromium trioxide plus sulfuric acid gives chromic acid. And chromic acid is generated in the reaction mixture, um, and so it's quite often not written above the arrow, but you may see it written directly as well. Now let's talk about the mechanism of this process because it's a great illustration of this idea that the way oxidations of alcohols work involves establishing a good leaving group at the alcohol oxygen. The mechanism involves formation of what's called a chromate ester, and we'll see why it's called a chromate ester here in a second. So first and foremost, chromic acid is a pretty good acid, and it's got the ability to protonate the alcohol oxygen, like so. So we end up with a protonated alcohol and the conjugate base of chromic acid. Now that conjugate base of chromic acid can now add in at the electrophilic carbon linked to this water leaving group right here. This is an SN2 step and this establishes the chromate ester intermediate. There are other mechanistic possibilities for this process but this to me seems the simplest and this is a chromate ester. It's called a chromate ester because we have a CRO double bond and a CRO single bond like this, reminiscent of a carboxylic ester, which we've seen previously. Now in the chromate ester, we have a good leaving group linked to the alcohol oxygen. Now it may not look like it, right? You probably haven't seen this group before. And so I wanna talk a little bit about how we know this is a good leaving group. This is chromium in a very, very, very high oxidation state. And I encourage you to pause the video and try to work out the oxidation number of chromium in this compound. This means that it's dying for electrons. It would love to take this pair of electrons with it and get out of town to lower its oxidation number. In that sense, it's a good leaving group or nuclear fusion. And so what happens at this stage then is deprotonation at this carbon linked to the hydroxyl group in the original alcohol and loss of the leaving group. This establishes a CO double bond. This accomplishes the oxidation essentially. And I left out the base just to um, save a little bit of space, but probably water would be the base that would remove that proton under these strongly acidic conditions. So the way we have it drawn here, it's akin to an E2 elimination, establishing the CO double bond. Now how does this get all the way up to the carboxylic acid? Well, at this point, a process occurs that we'll talk about more when we discuss hydrations of ketones and aldehydes in the near future. For now, take my word for it that water can add to the aldehyde under these acidic aqueous conditions. Notice H2SO4 is coming in aqueous solution. And we get a compound that looks like this, a hydrate in which water has added to the aldehyde. That's why it's called a hydrate. And now we can think about the subsequent steps as this top bit happening again just with one of the two hydroxyl groups in this hydrated aldehyde. And so 
we get formation of a chromate ester, and that eliminates to establish a new CO double bond, but now we're at a carboxylic acid, since that other OH group was just kind of hanging around, and now we're at an oxidation state of plus three at the carbonyl carbon. And Jones' conditions are so vigorous that you can't stop at the aldehyde stage and undergoes very rapid hydration and further oxidation to the carboxylic acid. So the final product we get out of these Jones oxidation conditions is the carboxylic acid, starting from a primary alcohol. We start from a secondary alcohol, as shown in the second example, we end at a ketone.